in the Judean foothills and all along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea toward Lebanon, the Hithites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They formed a, unite, a unified alliance to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they acted deceptively. They gathered provisions and took worn out sacks on their donkeys and old wineskins and cracked and mended. They wore old patched sandals on their feet and threadbare clothing for their bodies. Their entire provision of bread was dry and crumbly. They went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him, and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land. Please make a treaty with us. Now verse 14. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but did not seek the Lord's decision. So Joshua established peace with them and made a treaty to let them live. And the leaders of the community swore an oath to them. Three days after making the treaty, they heard that the Gibeonites were their neighbors. So the Israelites set out and reached the Gibeonite cities on the third day. And when they were at their cities of Gibeon, Kephara, Be'eroth, and kiriath Jerim, but the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the community had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. But the whole Israelite community grumbled against the leaders. Now verse 22. So Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said to them, Why did you deceive us by telling us you live far from us when you actually lived among us? Therefore you are cursed and will always be slaves, woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. The Gibeonites answered him, It was clearly communicated to your servants that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. We greatly feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. Now we are in your hands. Do to us whatever you think is right. Please be seated. So I want to say one, make one announcement before I begin uh, the sermon. If, if you're a member, let me ask you uh, to stay after the service. We have a vote on um, a purchase for the facility renewal plan we have. But we also have an important announcement. So we're going to have... Um, we're going to give a, a five-minute clock after the service for uh, those of you to go get your kids and then come right back in here. But I'm going to ask you to come back in here. Don't leave if you're a member. You need to be in here uh, for the meeting. You, you don't want to miss this. That's all I'm going to say. Chapter 9 of Joshua. When cons become converts. Now, you may be tempted to read a book uh, like Joshua and, and think, what does God want us to learn from this narrative. Let's be honest here, faithful, biblical interpretation, responsible interpretation of Scripture, I believe, requires diligent study and thinking. It requires effort on our parts. But we're not left alone in our efforts, are we? The same God who wrote the Scripture also gives us His Spirit to interpret the Scripture. Now, the basic principle as we enter a book like Joshua and we talk about it and wrestle with it week after week is, I think, found in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Things that happened to them, Israel, long ago were written for our instruction. Or as Paul says in Romans 15, verse 4, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scripture we might have hope. Now, hope is something we all need, isn't it? Every single one of us. And I believe at the end of this study this morning, we'll have just that. And there's two principles I want us to look at this morning. There is, number one is there is wisdom in seeking God's guidance, and there is nobility in honoring one's word. Those are two principles, but here's the overarching I believe proclamation. There's one glorious proclamation in this passage. Above the principles that we can apply to us, there's this glorious proclamation that says this, the grace of God covers all human sin and failure. Amen? That's good news. The grace of God covers all sin and human failure. 
failure. And I, I would argue that's actually one of the main themes of Scripture. You can read almost every story and see that theme in Scripture. So as we pick up this particular narrative, let's be aware of the situation. So after, in chapter 7 and 8, and after the uh, erection of the altar declaring God's victory in Jericho and Ai, Joshua and Israel prepares to keep moving into the land. And, and remember, the, when they built the altar of God's victory, it was laying claim, God was laying claim to the possession of the whole land. And therefore, Israel, as the people of God, lay claim to the whole land. And because of this, they are immediately in conflict with the entire Canaanite people. It's no coincidence then when you get to chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, you read this. When all the kings heard about Jericho and Ai, they formed a unified alliance to fight against Joshua and Israel. This makes sense, right? If, if Israel's coming after you and they have a, a record of victory, you, you, you better group up and, and become allies. You better join forces for battle. But here's what doesn't make sense, just as you, as you read and realize there's these people named the Gibeonites. Verses 3 and 4. Now, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done in Jericho and Ai, they, they acted deceptively, or as the NIV translated, they, they resorted to a ruse. So what they do is they break away from the others who have allied together to act on their own. Now, why would you choose an action that could be interpreted as rebelling against the other kings of your land? Well, we're going to look at that this morning as the narrator, I believe, focuses in on Joshua, Israel, and the Gibeonites, so we will as well. There's only two points this morning. Number one is this. The wisdom of seeking God's guidance. I think all of us would attest there is wisdom in seeking God's guidance. We're going to look at verses 1 through 15. Now, as I say every week, because this is a narrative, a story, I'm going to reference Scripture and read most of it. But have your Bibles opened or turned on and, and you stay with me, verses 1 through 15, and, and, and notice what I'm preaching from. Look down at the verses. Wrestle with the text. Now, notice the actions that the Gibeonites resorted to in verses 4 through 5. So listen, listen to what they do. They, they gather provisions, right? They took worn out sacks and, on their donkeys and, and old wineskins and, who were cracked and mended. They wore old patched sandals on their feet and threadbare clothing on their bodies. And their entire provision of bread was dry and crumbly. Some of your translations may read moldy. So their clothes are tattered, their sandals are frayed, their wineskins are cracked, their, their sacks on the donkeys, they're, they're worn out with age and their bread, the bread they have is dry and moldy and crumbly. They have carefully dressed themselves so that their appearance will be convincing evidence of the story they're about to give. What I find interesting in verse 6 while verses 4 and 5 are certainly lies, they are being deceptive. Verse 6 shows an amount of shrewdness on the Gibeonites. They are not only prepared in appearance, they are also prepared to appeal to the word of God. They went to Joshua, verse 6, in the camp of Gilgal and said to him, and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land. Please make a treaty with us. Notice the last, last sentence there. We've come from a distant land. Make a treaty with us. I believe this shows familiarity with Israel's scriptures. So consider this. that The Gibeonites knew. They knew that God was working through Israel to dispossess the land and exterminate all the people in Canaan. Deuteronomy 7.2 states this very clearly. When God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Deuteronomy 7, verse 2. Yet in the narrative, the Gibeonites plead with Israel several times, make a treaty with us. 
This is where their claim to be from a distant land becomes important. They seem to have known that in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 18, it says that Israel can live with distant lands located beyond the borders of Canaan. They can leave live peaceably with them. And what it says is, in the cities beyond the borders of Canaan, God permitted Israel to offer terms of peace, not to destroy them if the people are willing to serve doing forced labor. This is exactly why they say, we're from a distant land, and this is why they say, we're your servants. Very shrewd. They know what they're doing. Notice the men of Israel in verse 7 ask this, perhaps Wait a minute, perhaps you you live among us. How can we make a treaty with you? There's almost a a general assumption they understand the the terms of agreement here. And then Joshua steps in in verse 8 and says basically the same thing. Tell tell us again, where are you from? Who are you and where are you from? Are you sure you're not from around here? I mean, the the skepticism is pretty obvious. There's a questioning, there's a doubt. And and notice the Gibeonites never answer the question directly. They simply replied in verse 9, Your servants have come from a faraway land because of the reputation of your God. Now, I would imagine this was encouraging for Joshua to hear. That the the word of the Lord, that his fame had been spreading to distant lands. And it was being spoken about by by people in distant lands. And... And plus, look at it. They have tangible evidence. They, they look like they are from a distant land. Their, their wineskins, their sandals, their clothes, it's, it's all convincing, the whole thing. The Oscar goes to the Gibeonites here. But Israel should have paid a little bit more attention to their doubt. They had doubt. They, they, they had doubt for, for a moment. Verse 7. The Gibeonites are very vague about where they're from, and, and they repeatedly ask Israel to make a treaty, and and Joshua, or one of the leaders, should have pressed in and, and said, no, no, tell us exactly where you're from. But hindsight is always twenty twenty. So In verses 14 and 15, the men of Israel took some of their provisions. So I don't know if they, I don't know if they examined the moldy bread or they ate it. I don't know. We're just going to leave that. God will maybe answer that one later for us. They took some of their provisions, but this is the hinge point of the chapter. But they did not seek the Lord's decision. So Joshua, therefore, they did not seek the Lord's decision. Therefore, Joshua established peace with them and made a treaty to live, let them live. And the leaders of the community swore an oath to them. A couple of observations here on the text. Number one, there seems to be no unity in the leadership here in Israel. Notice the confusion, the untidy changes of subject throughout the, the narrative. It's the men of Israel who were skeptical, in verse 7. They're skeptical when they inspect the, 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 the Gibeonites' provisions. The men of Israel, then it says the leaders of the community made an oath with them, in verse 15. And, but it was Joshua himself who makes the peace. So the reader might read this and see that the narrator is going back and forth between different groups and think, well, who's in charge and who's to blame for this? There was lack of clarity, and therefore there, there, there became division. And because of this, this erupts in verse 18 later when the people began to murmur against the leadership. So there's, there's no unity among the leaders. But here's what's more important. There was no attentiveness to God's word. Someone should have said, wait, let's inquire of God. Let's look into his word. Let's even stop and pray here. Verse 14, the hinge of the whole story. They did not seek the Lord's decision. So Joshua, Joshua was not careful to follow the instruction of God's word. You know, Numbers 27, Joshua should have known, Numbers 27 should have reminded them, should have reminded him that in times where you need direction, Joshua had direct contact, had direct access to the consultation available through the priest. God's clear direction was revealed in his word, and the priest was there to minister that, but that was all ignored. And not only did the, the Joshua and the men not ask the right questions, not only did they not examine the word, they didn't even stop and pray. So the, the, what you get here is that the men of Israel presumed to be wise enough to handle the situation themselves. 
And because of this, they end up compromising what God commanded them, and they did not stop and consult the Word. You know, we must always be careful, all of us. We are always tempted by the subtle belief that we have this under control, that we know what to do here. God has revealed his will in his word. Now, you may be tempted to trivialize the word of God. That is, acknowledge that God has spoken, but pay little attention to it. Not test your actions or your decisions by the word. You may be tempted to tamper with the word of God, which is to take his instruction and bend it to meet your own needs or cross out the parts you don't like so you can just obey the parts you do like. But I believe that the proper response is to tremble at God's word. Now this does not mean, let me be clear, this does not mean that we paralyze all decisions and and cripple into the everlasting arms, as one pastor said. We lean on the everlasting arms with a humble trembling, realizing that God has revealed his will to us We can be wise in obeying it. Scripture is not exhaustive, but it's more than sufficient to guide us in decision making. We're always tempted. All of us are tempted to go about trusting in our own strength to trivialize or tamper with God's word. But the person who trembles, the person who trembles at God's word, that's the person who humbly confesses that it is indeed God's word and is eager to obey it. And the simple truth that I think we learn from from Joshua over and over and over is since God has given us his word to guide us for all of life and obedience, we must affirm and embrace it as truth and its authority over us, period. Isaiah 66, 2 tells us, The one to whom God will look is the one who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at God's word. Joshua failed to stop and pray. Joshua failed to seek the word of the Lord in this situation. Israel itself failed to to hold one another accountable. They relied on their own wisdom and ended up being duped by the Gibeonites. And this is so ironic that I would I think that the Gibeonites seem to have applied God's word more shrewdly than Joshua and the Israelites here in this situation. You know, even in things that appear to be straightforward, we must be cautious as to not be certain of or rely on our own perspectives. Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, and by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Everything. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. James 1. If any of you, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith and not doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And I would argue that's exactly what they were doing, being driven and tossed by the wind. So here's here's what I think we can learn from this part of the narrative here. First, the people didn't hold each other accountable. The men of Israel, the, the leaders of Israel, Joshua, whoever it is, they didn't hold each other accountable. God has placed his people in a community so they can provide wise counsel and decision making. Someone should have said, what do the scriptures say? Second, God has spoken here. He spoke, you can read in the Torah what you're supposed to do in these situations. And knowledge of his word is still essential for living today. At several points in the book of Joshua, Joshua is careful to be obedient to what the word says, but not here. And the whole community pays for it. Third, no one stopped and prayed. As one well-known quote says, Beware of thinking 
that God will do for us apart from prayer what he has promised to do only through prayer. The one who has given us his word has also given us his spirit to interpret and imply, apply the word. And the spirit who enables us to interpret and apply the word also dwells within the people of God, which God has placed around us to provide us wise counsel. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Number two. There is wisdom in seeking God's guidance. And number two, there is nobility in honoring one's word. Chapter 9, verses 16 through 27. So here's where we are in the scene now. Israel is marching towards the Gibeonite cities. An action, I believe, by the language which resembles a military parade. Remember, the, the, their, their deception has been revealed now, the Gibeonite cities are only seven miles away from Ai, maybe 14 or 15 from Gilgal, where Israel was camped. So a, a three-day journey is hardly a distant land by their standards. So Israel, they, they march up to the city, and, and they have, they're forced to make a decision here. They're forced to make a decision. Number one, will they break the fundamental terms of the mandate to occupy the land by letting the Gibeonites live because that's contrary to Deuteronomy 7 or will they break an oath made before God which they are equally bound? Nineteen through 21. All the leaders answer them, we have sworn... We have sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. We have sworn an oath by the name of our God, and now we cannot touch them. So this is how we'll treat them. We will let them live so that no wrath will fall on us because of the oath we swore to them. They also said, let them live. So the Gibeonites became woodcutters and water carriers for the whole community as the leaders had promised them. So to break an oath sworn in the Lord's name, even if it was wrongly obtained, would bring judgment upon Israel because it would dishonor God before others. Breaking an oath sworn in God's name implies that God cannot be trusted. Modern Christians, modern Christians we, we Christians in the West, we have a hard time understanding why Israel sticks to this oath. Because we, we, we have such a low view of giving our word, don't we? I mean, I think the people in our culture, they, they embody what German atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said when he said, everyone lies and no one minds. The honorable example of the Israelites here is that they kept their word. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And at the very basic sense of what he's saying there is, is that our character should be of such integrity that our words can always be believed as true, even without an oath. One might say, well, well Israel was tricked. I mean, the Israel was tricked. Doesn't that, doesn't that play into this? No. They gave their word, an oath before God. They're not going to break their word, even if the oath was wrongly obtained. They resolved to live faithfully before God, even in this twisted situation. So yes, they made a mistake, but they've decided after that they're going to be obedient, regardless of the situation. I think there are times when we too are called to live in obedience in light of our folly. There are times when our preferences, our comforts, our justifications cannot change our call to live in obedience. Simply put, we must, reli we must resolve. I think all of us must resolve to live faithfully even in after our disobedience. No matter what the consequences are for our previous sins. And I'm sure there have been times where you've been disobedient or sinned or made a mistake. And you could have done something after that, maybe deceptively or sinfully, to justify yourself or protect yourself. Or you could have told the truth, which would have implications. Christians are always to tell the truth. 
What's fascinating here is both Israel and the Gibeonites, they sinned in this narrative. Israel failed to heed the word of God. The Gibeonites bore false witness. And what's beautiful is God shows grace to both. What happens next? Verse 22. They've marched to the city and Joshua stands before them and says, Why did you deceive us? Why? Verse 24 and 25, the Gibeonites answer him, It was clearly communicated to your servants. It was clearly communicated to us that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. And we greatly feared for our lives. This is why we did this. Now we are in your hands. Do to us whatever you think is right. It's an ironic turn of events that the curse of the Gibeonites here echoes their introduction. Remember, they introduced themselves as servants and now they are becoming servants. Verse 26 to 27. So this is what Joshua did to them. He rescued them from the Israelites and they did not kill them. Joshua rescued them from him. Let me just stop here and say this. When you trust in the gospel, when you trust in the good news of the gospel, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, to forgive you of sin, you're being rescued from the wrath of God. God is rescuing you from God. So on that day, he made them woodcutters and water carriers, and they are today for the community and for the Lord's altar at the place he would choose. I love this story. I mean, it's full of grace. The Gibeonites escape with their lives, but they live under a curse. But there is a certain redemption in this text. If you pay close attention to the details, the gift they receive is greater than the curse. Notice that the Gibeonites were brought into a situation where they would naturally acquire a deeper knowledge of the one true God as they dwell in his courts. They're water carriers and woodcutters in the courts of God. So their, their service is fetching water and wood for the sacrifices at the Lord's altar. So they're always around the presence of worship. Isn't that amazing? I mean, do you hear the Gibeonites' response? Listen to verse 9 and verse 24 again. I, I want you to understand this because I think there's something amazing going on here with them. Your servants, verse 9, your servants have come because of the reputation of the Lord your God. We heard of his fame. We heard of what he did. We've heard about your God. Verse 24. It was communicated to us that, that from God, he, he gave his servant Moses the command to take the land and destroy the people. And we greatly feared for our lives. We've heard about your God. We fear for our lives. Is that faith? You could argue, well, I suppose there, there's nothing different here than the faith of demons that James talks about when he says that even the, the demons believe and shudder. But, but listen to me for a second. Consider the fact that, first of all, the Gibeonites rebelled against the kings of their own land in seeking solace before God. Now, quite possibly, I don't know this for sure, but how, how would they know the word of God? They, 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 they're very, they very clearly said it's been communicated to us. We don't know how. Perhaps they, they, they saw the altars that were um, written in stone, the, the words of God written in stone from, from chapter 8. We don't know. But if you pay close attention to the words of the Gibeonite narrative and then look back at the Rahab narrative of, of chapter 2, you begin to see something quite amazing. Like the Gibeonites, Rahab was a Canaanite. Like the Gibeonites, Rahab had faith that God was going to be true to his word and strike down Canaan and give it to Israel. Like the Gibeonites, Rahab responded in fear of God and his people Israel. Like the Gibeonites, Rahab acted with cunning, even deceit, that she and her family might find refuge under the one true God. 
So I think the parallels between this story and that story are, are not, not, they're not a coincidence. I think the author is communicating something to us. Those who were subject to God's judgment are saved to serve as subjects in his court. And what's amazing, if you continue reading the Old Testament, the Gibeonites are still serving God in in 2 Samuel. In fact, they're named among those who are building the wall in Nehemiah. So here's what this narrative, in my opinion, seems to be demonstrating. On more than one occasion, God indeed intends to bless all. All of the peoples of the earth through Israel, according to his promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Isn't this amazing that pagans like Rahab and the Gibeonites may believe in Israel's God and find deliverance from certain death and under God's grace, despite of their deception and their sin? When they seek refuge in God, their, their, their sin is covered and they're delivered from death. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I think the incorporation of the Gibeonites here into Israel shows the mercy and grace of God to all people, regardless of who you are and what you've done. God has a heart for those who are far from him. He always has. And even if in the mystery of his sovereign providence, it was through the Gibeonites' deceit and the disobedience and failures of Israel, we can stop and say his grace is sufficient Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unscrutable are his ways. Now we do acknowledge as we close that the, neither the Gibeonites or Israel came out of the story untainted, but by the grace of God, well, his grace superabounds over all of their sin and failure. And once again, God is the hero of the story. And I believe this leads us directly to the cross. We see this in the clearest possible way as Paul proclaims in Romans 5. The free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, how much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace of that one man Jesus abound for the many? So that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's still true that even today, the gift of grace is greater than the curse. Amen? Even today, cons can become converts. The grace of God covers all human sin and failure. Period. God is good. And Christ's death and resurrection are more than sufficient to bring you into a relationship with God. Isn't this amazing? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We stop in absolute wonder and amazement that in your sovereign providence, your will is always done. And as we look at Joshua and Israel, they fail miserably so many times, forgetting from one battle to the next your commands. And yet by grace, you do not leave or forsake them. And Father, we see your grace in Rahab and the Gibeonites that foreigners who fear your name and submit to your word are brought into the community of faith. In this text, in this book, we have seen, God, that you are both a mighty warrior who executes justice and righteousness. And you're also a God of grace who shows mercy to those who bow the knee.
So, Father, today may we tremble at your word. May we stand in awe of your might and your mercy. And we thank you that in Christ we can stand not frightened, but confident, covered in the robes of your righteous Son. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said,